Well, welcome. Thank you, Irv, for reminding us of our responsibility to the state of Israel. And uh, we're so glad to be back with you uh, this afternoon. Yom Kippur calls on us to candidly confront and acknowledge the brokenness in our lives and in the world, to see with clarity our own and our society's faults and failures, shortcomings and wrongdoings, missteps and mistakes, and to commit ourselves not only to repairing what has been broken, but to charting a better course moving forward. That sacred charge of Yom Kippur lands with special poignancy this year as we wrestle with the moral and spiritual challenges surfaced by the pandemic, the recession, widespread social unrest, and environmental disasters that have upended our lives and our world. In this context, what does or what should tshuva or repentance and kapara atonement mean for us today? What repairs are needed for the brokenness we are confronting? And how can we do that necessary work? I'm so grateful today to explore these questions and more with my dear friend and wise teacher, Reverend Melting Mullen. Reverend, Mel Reverend Mullen is Director of Reconciliation, Justice, and Creation Care for the Episcopal Church, where she leads the church's work on racial, economic, and environmental justice. Some of you might remember Reverend Mullen from her time here in Richmond when she served as the downtown missioner at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. Melanie is a skilled community builder and has a demonstrated passion for social justice. And I'm honored to call her my friend and to welcome her into our community today. Uh, Melanie, Reverend Mullen, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much for having me and letting me be a part of your reflection and prayerful entry into this really blessed holiday. Well, it's so nice to have you here. So nice to see you. So nice to be with you today. Tell me, how are you? Uh, how are you doing during, you know, all of this? Um, I am learning from a friend that it is of more value to be honest and say that I am doing as well and as miserable as everyone else. We are riding through waves and times of trial, all of us, no matter how privileged and how lucky you are. And so I'm um, holding that um, fragility and vulnerability as well as going, I'm also really glad that I have the chance to be here speaking, serving and doing the work. Yeah, I appreciate that. I had a friend once who's, who, whose father passed away and in Jewish tradition uh, for the week after uh, a loved one's burial, we do something called sit shiva. Shiva means seven. So it's a seven day mourning period. It's like the most intense period of mourning. And I asked him, you know, one day during that, you know, how he was doing. And he said, I'm, I'm shiva good. Right. And so I think that that's kind of what you're saying, right? I'm pandemic good. Pandemic um, good. So I appreciate it. Um, so, okay, so let's start with this. Let's jump right in. If that's okay. Um, we sometimes translate Yom Kippur as the day of atonement. Uh, but I, I think atonement is, is not a common or comfortable word for people today. Uh, I suspect that most of us couldn't define it with precision or, or competence. So, I'm wondering, how would you define atonement? Uh, and what, what does that word mean to you? Yeah, I love that. Um, I have to say, this is not a word that Christians in my tradition are really good at. Um, we have some queasiness and uneasiness with the idea. But the one little characteristic that we give everybody from little kids in Sunday school on up is to say, you can remember it by spelling it out in English, at one minute, meaning that you're on the right track with atonement if you're getting closer to being one with God. And hopefully that will point people's moral compasses towards what's right. Is it seeming like you're getting close to being at one with God? And so that's, that's my touchstone for atonement, um, despite the fact that we are, as a culture and as a society, not great about thinking about when do we do repair? When do we do repentance? When do we do atonement? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I love that. And I, I, I think about that so much, you know, in, in a moment, I want to dig in a little bit to our scriptural reading for today, our Torah reading for today. Uh, but I, a lot of times I think about it in, in that way that the, that the process of that ancient ritual was kind of meant to kind of clear away the roadblocks, clear away the blockages in our relationship with, with God. 
And so today in, in Yom Kippur, as we, um, uh, as we confess to our transgressions from the year that's passed, as we seek uh, forgiveness for the ways in which we've, we've gone astray, um, it's always phrased uh, in, uh, in, in like a repair of relationship, whether it's a repair of relationship between one another or a repair of relationship between us and God. Uh, so we say um, uh, in introducing the confessional prayer, Ki anu amecha ve'ata Elohein, right? we are your people and you are your God. And we give this litany of the relationship we have with God with the implication being that the ways that we've gone astray um, ha have all kind of had the function of putting barriers between us and each other and barriers between yes. us and God. So if that's, if that's true, uh, and you alluded to this a little bit, I, I wonder um, how, how should we be thinking about that at one mint today in a time where we're beset with intersecting traumas of pandemic, recession, reckoning with racial injustice and environmental disasters? I'm really resonating with this concept of relationship. We are pointing ourselves so heavily to the idea that, well, first and foremost, all breaches, all breaks, our sins are also sins against God. They're breaking our relationship with others as well as with God. And so when we think about atonement, it's always helpful um, to triangulate in this most healthy of ways to triangulate God. God's vision into what it actually meant for community, for self, for identity, as the sort of check against our own delusions and illusions, especially today in a time of COVID, a time of anxiety, fires, ecological devastation. People are nervous about the election and not knowing how to reflect to resonating and newfound fears about racial injustice. And all of that can send us into this spiral of emotional fear and anxiety and that atonement pointing back to relationship I think is a grounding place a place where we first start to think about where are we at one with God well being in relationship and is it right relationship with one another with the earth with communities as a whole yeah um you know what what that points to to me is is actually uh, part of your title which is uh, reconciliation uh, and I, I want to touch on that in a little while. Uh, so I want to like maybe put a pin in that because uh, I, I really do want to explore that. But I, but I want to um, uh, hone in on the uh, theme of, of racial justice for, for a moment. And uh, I want to do it by, by taking a slightly deep and like Bible nerd dive into the uh, Torah reading today, the scriptural reading for today, which is from Leviticus chapter 16. So um, it's supposed to help us understand theoretically how atonement works, or at least how it used to work when our ancient ancestors worshiped by sacrificing animals in the temple in Jerusalem, um, which by the way, I have uh, some uh, version, some editions of Christian Bible in my office. And one of my favorites is um, called the Action Bible. Um, so it's like a cartoon, a comic strip version of the Bible, but it's it's a it's it's a it's clearly produced for Christian audiences, and it has you know has like lots of Genesis, has lots of Exodus, um, and it has lots of uh, like numbers. Uh, it has one page from Leviticus, and it's this page. It's the page of this atonement ritual uh, that isn't uh, what we understand as the Yom Kippur ritual. Um, so one part of the ritual is especially curious and notoriously difficult to interpret. According to the Torah, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies with two goats. One was sacrificed to God there in the shrine as a purification offering meant to cleanse the children of Israel for their sins. And the other was des designated for Azazel and was sent out to the desert, presumably to die. Scholars have long disagreed about what for Azazel means. According to some, Azazel was a demon who dwelled in the desert. According to others, Azazel was the name of a place in the desert where the goat was sent. And others say that Azazel refers to the status of the goat, a contraction of the Hebrew words az, which means goat, and azal, which means goes away, meaning the goat that goes away, or, or scapegoat as we call it today. But this year, there's one interpretation that, that really caught my eye, and I had, for whatever reason, long overlooked it. So it says this, uh, the school of Rabbi Yishmael taught, Azazel is so called because it atones for the actions of Uzzah and Azael. Okay, so this is where the like Bible nerd like deep dive part goes. Okay, so just stay with me for like a thread here. Okay, um, so who were Uzzah and Uzzah in Azael? 
according to Jewish tradition, these are the names of the B'nai Ha'elohim, or the sons of God, or sons of the gods, um, that we see in Genesis chapter 6. It more literally, more likely means probably prominent or powerful men or princes. Um, and we're told in Genesis 6 that their sins resulted in God pledging to destroy humanity with the flood. It's a complicated passage in and of itself, but I have good reason to believe that it refers to the fact that in the generations leading up to the flood, powerful men were committing robbery, including robbery of human beings and by means of rape or enslavement with widespread impunity. And other powerful prominent men who the text calls Nephilim or fallen ones did nothing to stop or even speak out against the prince's reprehensible behavior. They could have said or done something, but they stood idly by. And God vows to destroy all humanity because men of privilege and power were serial abusers and other men of privilege and power looked the other way. And it stands to reason that when the average person saw that a crime like kidnapping, enslavement, or rape could be committed with impunity, then they too probably felt free to cast aside norms and perpetrate whatever abuses they desired. So according to the school of Rabbi Ishmael, the scapegoat is sacrificed thousands of years later as an annual act of communal atonement for that ancient sin. So it begs the question to me, why should people who aren't guilty of a crime, indeed, they weren't even alive, right? They weren't a glimmer in their mama's eye uh, when the crime was being committed, still bear responsibility for that crime. Why did the children of Israel have to atone for the sins of their ancient ancestors whom they never knew? And it strikes me that that same issue is before us today. We both come from religious communities that um, have complicated relation, have complicated histories when it comes to racial injustice. On the one hand, the American Jewish community, and I suspect that this is true of the American Episcopalian community, um, is predominantly white. Many of us have benefited from the color of our skin, even if inadvertently. We've also participated in and benefited from racist systems like housing, education, criminal justice, even if unintentionally. At the same time, I assume that, mo that most white American Jews, like most white American Episcopalians, would object if anyone were to call them racist. Interpersonally, they try to treat all people equally. They would never knowingly hurl a racial epithet. Uh, and they may even give their time, talent, and treasure to support the black community. Most American Jews, like most Episcopalians, are politically progressive and see themselves as part of the solution to American racism not part of the problem. So given all this, here's the question, okay? <laughs> if you're with me still, given that, how do we talk about our culpability and the persistence of racism within our communities in a productive way? How do we talk to folks about repentance for a sin that they don't believe they had a hand in committing? Yeah. Um, first, I don't know if I'm appalled that your um, cartoon Bible has this one page from Leviticus, but it seems like the right page. This idea of scapegoating is so central, I think, to not only the way Christians understand their faith, but also sort of the way our American culture has grown up. Um, we always need an other, the other. And what we do to the other, some folks and theologians and scholars would say is kind of written into our ability and identity as humans. We point and place our sins, our guilt, our fear on the other, no matter what. And it could be because of race, it could be because of origin, gender, any number of things. But that scapegoating impulse, um, it sometimes can act that out in a positive way. Um, Christianity loves the idea of Jesus being this lamb, this fit to slaughter, to do the work for us. And yet still, we still live our lives where there's a constant other, a constant need to place all of the otherness, the fear, the blame, the darkness on. And in American society, uh, since 1619, if you remember in reading the New York Times wonderful supplemental, um, the other has been for us in a lot of ways of people of African descent. Um, as a Southerner, as a person who was rooted in ministry in Richmond, Virginia, that is very close to home. But when you think about the ways in which um, in the very early centuries of our American society, the way we've written our laws, created our banking system, all of our customs were sort of 
around that other? What do you do with an other that you might need to grow your empire, to build your farms, and also are afraid of, and also then have to deal with a cascading mountain of sins? Um, one way to think about it, but a lot of ways in. But also that question begs now, here we are in 2020, um, what happens when the sins that were committed, the things that were put into place way back when, 1619 and on, are, are owned? I mean, I'm thinking about uh, the Jeremiah, what happens when um, the parents um, have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? Who owns the culpability for that sin? Uh, I find that a lot of uh, theologians who embrace the idea of liberation, who embrace the idea of sort of anti-colonialist um, impulses will say one of two things, that part of our role in like inheriting a system is that we're not just dealing with our individual selves, we're dealing with our corporate selves, a people. Um, and that's very radical for Americans, our hyper individualist selves. Um, even for a lot of evangelical Americans, you might think that, well, you've got the personal Jesus, so he makes it all right for you. And, um, our faith, and the way I understand it, is constantly calling us back to this corporate sense of self. God has a message and a vision for God's people and peoples. And so that's one way in which, um, fair or not, we inherit the legacy of peoples and the way that people's, peoples have treated each other for time immemorial. And the other way to sort of think about it is that um, we think about, I love thinking about sort of young activists, um, especially my other job in climate role, who are constantly in a place of grief and realization that what happens when you inherit a brokenness, not just a guilt, but a brokenness in the earth. You know, uh, young folks are always telling me we weren't the ones who destroyed the planet, our parents, grandparents, great parents did, and yet, responsibility still carries on. Um, and so that's not a statement of guilt and badness of a person, but it is a statement of what is our duty to each other? Um, what have we inherited now as our role? Um, so there's a lot of ways to think about that, um, this corporate and community um, inheritance that could be brokenness. It can be sin. It can be a, a practice of othering that we have yet to break with. And hopefully whenever generations realize that they're repeating this practice of scapegoating, they have the opportunity to break that as well, keeping in mind what right relationship is, what God's vision is. So, um, it's, a hard, it's a hard lesson. It's a hard and big task to, to conquer. But yeah. You also talk, touched on some really challenging issues of when, what are we talking about? What does it mean when we say someone has inherited racism or living into a role where they might be labeled as a racist? What does it mean to be a part of a system anyways? You didn't choose it, you didn't make it up, and yet are you guilty for it? Um, and that's part of the gifts and the challenges. I like to think of folks who um, push back about the idea of being defined by your race um, or being defined now here like, about privilege as going, well, I am not personally and individually the inheritor of great privileges. But I, I love this definition of privilege as being safety. It's safety. And we all have some ways in which we have been gifted that in our lives economically. It could be the fact that we're born on these shores with a blue passport. We've got these bits of safety. And in that safety, it should give us this vantage point, this safe harbor to look out and then explore what's going on in our community. Once again, where the scapegoating is, where the otherness is happening, where the pains are. It's, it's a gift to use to sort of go back and ask the question. Are we in right relationship as God would have defined it for ourselves, for our communities, and for people? But yeah, huge question, huge dilemma, huge problem. Yeah, and, and, and you offered so much there. I mean, you know, uh, privilege has become such a, um, uh, such a charged word, but uh, I um, heard, a, I, I saw a sign uh, the other day that said, um, privilege is thinking that something is not a problem because it's not happening to you. Uh, and I think that that's a, a powerful way of thinking about it in, in some sense, right? Because um, there, are, uh, um, there, there are people who, who even question in this moment, you know, the, the existence of racism, the persistence of, of, of racial bias, um, racial discrimination. Uh, and, uh, and I, you know, and, and uh, I often wonder, you know, how much of that is related to the fact that like, uh, that it's that it's 
you know, hard to, uh, to place yourself in, in someone else's shoes, uh, especially when uh, you are the beneficiary of a society that is, um, that is uh, set up uh, to, um, uh, to, to benefit certain groups of people, but not necessarily other groups of people, even if you are not uh, the highest beneficiary of those, be of, of those gifts, right? That, uh, that still um, uh, can have that impact and that, that effect. And, and you touched on something else uh, in your answer that I think is really important for us to think about on Yom Kippur, uh, which is, you know, when we, when we confess to transgressions on Yom Kippur, at least in the kind of formulaic way we do it within our liturgy, we confess in the plural, right? We say ashamnu, we, we are guilty. Bagadnu, uh, gazalnu, we have done all these things. And that means that we're confessing for things that we as individuals um, haven't necessarily done, right? And it, so it calls to mind what uh, uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said uh, famously that, um, uh, that some are guilty, but all are responsible, right? Mm -hmm. You may not have actually uh, committed the transgression, um, but we are all guilt. We are all responsible for sort of cleaning up the mess um, in the wake of those transgressions, having uh, having acted, or or being part of a culture that permits certain kinds of things to continue to go on. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where um, I love that idea that Episcopalians and of sort of Jews are in agreement that we also pray our confessions and make our statements of beliefs in the plural and tell one another that. If you can't believe one of these lines now, it's the us, it's the corporate us that does it for you. Um, and same thing with our sins and our transgressions. Um, we can list them a mile long, but it's not just our individual selves, it's our corporate selves. And not just in this time, but across history, that's a part of it. And, and history is a big part of thinking about where we are with the brokenness in our culture in regards to race. It, we're not in one point in time. And so when we're thinking about the usness that created the, the narrative or the social construct of who we are, the laws we live in and what we've inherited, we're thinking about the past, the present, and the future all together. We're part of this community um, of saints or people have gone on as well as holding ourselves with the people of the future. Yeah, I, so I wanna, I wanna touch on that for a second. You, you helped spearhead an initiative at St. Paul's to grapple with its historical complicity in, in white supremacy and racism, which led among other things to removing Confederate iconography from the church. Um, so I, I wanna ask you, what role does say taking down Confederate monuments play in reckoning with past racism? What do you say to people who argue that such acts are rewriting history? And what do you say to those who argue that centering white supremacy and racism in a telling of American history, like with the 1619 Project, is um, un-American propaganda. That may or may not be a quote from uh, one or another elected official. Uh, what role does or should history memory play in, in understanding the present and, and charting the future? Yeah, I, um, this is a area very close to my heart and um, close to the work at St. Paul's that's still going on. I, I think once again, there's a little bit of a great perspective of folks who live in the South to see this really clearly that we both inherit a history that can be um, turned into context for good or for evil. Um, the work that folks in a religious context, like in St. Paul's, we can think really specifically about beautiful stained glass windows. So, and it's the stories from the Bible. There's two story windows showing Moses leading the people, looking at Mount Nebo. And yet it's not the story itself, it's the way that we, the religious we, have been culpable and allowing a distorted narrative of God's story to be told. And, and that's where the guilt comes from. That's where our personal responsibility lies. It's, and what role have um, institutional religions, religions that are gifted with a place of power and privilege, very explicitly for uh, Episcopalians in the South, let the narrative that, that is quite frankly a lie take hold. Um, and part of the work of that correcting a narrative is number one, being really honest and clear about the impacts and the brokenness of it. Um, as the people at St. Paul's and other folks are doing when they think about Confederate monuments, it's sort of being really clear about are there harms and impact from this distorted narrative work? Um, what's the problem with having Robert E. Lee on a horse in the middle of a square? 
what does it do to people for generations? How does it justify excessive brutalities and sins that gets larger and larger as a slippery slope? Um, there's a psychologist uh, researcher who I love talks about the small lies corrupt ourselves and corrupt our ability to have right relationship. And so you go from little things where you make a saint out of a Confederate general to big things where then it's okay to deny people franchise, to create mob violence and to kill or anything you need necessary to remove people from the ability to live their full lives and to express themselves as equal children of God. Um, this is a slippery slope and just telling a story that is not true, that is distorted, that takes the power and puts it over somebody in dominion and domination. And that's the next piece of what happens when you correct the narrative. As scary as it is for folks who remember their grandparents growing up, knowing the name that Traveler is the horse that Robert Lee rode and that kind of thing, that there's a place in which you have to break with the reality and folks were afraid. Folks wondered what happens to the loving grandparent or great grandparent who was kind and generous and might have been good in every way, but had these distorted narratives. And we're, we're able to scapegoat and say, you know, I love everybody except those people that look different from me or have a different religion. Um, so correcting the story really helps people um, face something that's really frightening about who they are, what part of the story is in them, what part of the story is true in them. And yet learning to tell a bigger history is always liberating and freeing. Um, the one thing that we talked about at St. Paul's especially was when you look at the story of Moses in which, yes, Robert E. Lee was portrayed as Moses, there's still a truth to the original gospel and literal story. There's still a truth that's liberating. And for folks who were so caught up in sort of making saints of folks who were basically living and justifying brutality, oppression, exploitation, and slavery, the truth is still there that there are there are saints, there are forebears and patriarchs who give us a tradition of religion, tradition of freedom, and right relationship the way God meant it to be. And for folks in the South and for folks who have inherited the last names who put the wonderful windows up in the wall in our Southern cathedrals or put the statues up in the middle of Monument Avenue, some of that freedom and help and liberation comes in going, the people that we don't know, the names that we've erased, the actual people liberated from slavery in our American history and knowing and learning from them, from people who are brown skin, people who are other religions, that they have a witness in relationship to God is a place of liberation and truth. But getting there is the hard part. It's not erasing history. It's knowing that history is a tool, a resource for all of us. We use history every day when we read our scriptures, when we read our Torah, read the Bible, we use history to know what God intended for us, what generations from the past have been for us, what feels like truth and we'll continue to use that but not let it be used against us not let it be used as a weapon to torture and beat down and dominate others but yeah it's hard work um but not erasing history embracing history and asking honest questions this is what happens is this seeing people in the past as children of god and is this helping us go into the future and and i guess um a, a sort of corollary to that question is um is uh, where do reparations fit in uh, for you? To what extent do you believe that uh, reparations are, are necessary to atone for America's uh, historical and ongoing sins of white supremacy and, and racial injustice, right? I mean, can you correct that story um, and write the future without some kind of uh, um, restorative justice? Good question. And here's a place where I feel very lucky to be talking about this as people of faith, in faith institutions, really in like the institutional church especially, reparations feels very frightening. It could feel very punitive in a, in a broad scale, but in the Episcopal church at least, what we've seen is talking about the need to do repair, atonement, reconciliation work leads very naturally. You know, there's the repair of the breach, once you see what the breach is. And people who hold history very seriously, we hold it as important, are able to trace our history, not just our biblical history, but literally our financial history. Um, Episcopalians are sort of on the march with devoting um, to our diocese or our sort of our like, statewide groupings. Um, many of them are creating resolutions and making attempts to think about the forensic accounting. Where do we get this money, these properties, 
what allowed us to do this building of schools. And it's a hard history. For a lot of us, we can trace the growth of some of our institutions, our beautiful churches, our cathedrals to enslavement, the slave trade. We can do the forensic accounting because we're good at it. We write everything down and know that our wealth comes from ill-gotten gains and um, are able without a whole lot of um, pushback to then devote as they've done in Maryland and Texas, and New York and in um, Virginia schools to say, we are going to go ahead and lean in while we're sitting on endowments, we're sitting on investments. We will commit right now to mark those as reparations. And I think that's a model for our secular world as well. Um, but we can teach that to do sort of the, the moral accounting of what we've gotten and where it came from and then devote and say that we're not gonna repair the breach unless we invest in some way. So reparations could look very different. Um, if you're in a school institution, like a seminary, yes, you can point to children, people of color and give them scholarships, but what does it look like for a whole state of churches, whole diocese? That's part of the work they're exploring together, but much like sort of our conversations about people saying defund the police, uh, and when that turns into how do you reimagine where gifts and money and investments go? It's about reimagining a future that builds something very different from the past. So I think that's the creative work that once people trust each other and do that bold work, it can do together. But yes, repairing and doing that reconciliation work depends on reparations of some kind, but we have to devise that together. Right. So I love that creating a future that looks different from the past, I think is at the heart of what we talk about during the High Holy Days of, of Chuva, right, uh, which literally means to turn, right, so to go in a different direction than where you've been before, and, uh, and, and so many uh, of, the, uh, of, of the ancient medieval uh, sages say that there's no such thing as Chuva without honest confession and full restitution, um, right, and so I think that that's true in this case too, and I think that I love that, that we as, as uh, religious communities um, have a have a witness and a model for this um, that, uh, that 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 really can't we can't just say well you know what's past is past and we got to move on forward from it. Um, there there uh, you can't actually move on forward in a meaningful and constructive way without addressing the harm that was done because that harm continues to pull you back into the past. So right. I, we're we're almost out of time. I, we could go on forever and ever. Um, and I hope that we will. I hope we'll have more opportunities to talk together. But I wanted, I think, in, in a similar vein to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about where reconciliation fits into this. Or right? I know it's in your title. And so on some level, you, you believe that it's central to the work of ending racial injustice and other systemic forms of oppression. But something about it has always, and you and I have talked about this, something about it always uh, has felt um, a little soft to me. Um, Sorry, I had my timer going off. Um, <laughs> uh, something about it has uh, always felt a little soft to me um, that uh, like it's an avoidance of truthful reckoning and, and radical social transformation, like absolution without penance. Um, yeah. So what does reconciliation mean and look like for you? Fair enough. And I, I think you're right on the mark with, as we use these terms, they get very popular, I think, we are wary that the, the more people are eager to jump on the idea of reconciliation, it becomes perhaps too easy, too soft. It's a way of short circuiting the sort of hard work of also repair, of naming brokenness, sins, wrongs, and hurts. And when we short circuit that to just go to the, we're all unified, give a hug and move on. It's not authentic, it's not real, it's not true repentance of any kind. Um, yet, Reconciliation is the goal we want to get to. And so um, in my job with church, I'm trying to hold that line to make us all aware of there are and phases we get to. And you don't get there without being honest and telling an honest history. These are the sins, these are the brokenness. And then you don't get it without repairing relationships. Who are you working with to repair with? Um, it's really important. Our confessions of sins are that way. Our confessions of faith are also that way. They're detailed. Um, one of my favorite Preacher says, you know, if you're going to be wrong and loud about um, doing the work of reconciliation, don't be wrong about what you're reconciling about. Um, and so that's the hard personal place. It's also the hard corporate place. We have to name our sins before we get to the place where we can envision making a new vision, a new bridge, a new work. Um, but yes, it's the goal we want to get to. It feels good. It's, it's a type of godly love. 
And so when that feels right and that's drawing us, that's a wonderful thing. Drawn by the idea of people united, people in peace, people reconciled. But how we get there is sort of the work that we have to hold ourselves. Hopefully our faith will help us get there together as community. So I love that. And it's such a beautiful model, I think, uh, uh, for us to hold it throughout Yom Kippur, especially because it's really the trajectory of the holiday. And it's what we started with, I think, at the beginning. Right? What, we, what we do on Yom Kippur is we, we, we tell the truth. We take an honest accounting of, of where we've been and, and how we've gone astray, how we've broken our relationships, how we've broken our promises, um, how we've broken faith with one another and with God. Um, we try to repair it, right? So you know, we can't just skip to the re reconciliation part. Um, we, have to, we have to do the work of repairing the damage however we can. Um, and in, in this case, I think that you know, there is deep, widespread, and systemic damage uh, in the case of, of racial injustice, but certainly also of uh, environmental uh, degradation, which we hadn't even uh, gotten into, uh, but I know is a, a subject that's uh, dear to your heart and, and mine as well. Um, so there's, there's damage to repair there. And unless there's honesty, unless there is reparation, unless there's restoration, um, there can't be reconciliation. But reconciliation, un unification, right, relationship um, is ultimately the goal. It's what we're striving for on Yom Kippur. And, it, and uh, from your uh, uh, teaching, it's what we're striving for um, I think, in, in America and in our world today. So I, I'm so grateful to you uh, for all of the wonderful and sacred work that you do, for your incredible friendship, um, and for being such an inspiring teacher for us today on this holiest day of the year for the Jewish people. Thank you so much. Thank you and through your whole congregation. Although our country might be in a time of struggle and strife, we are both with you in spirit, but also looking to your example the way that you model moving towards accounting, being closer to God is sort of the work we all need to do as a country. And so I hope we can do this together because we need each other to make this happen. Amen, amen, amen. May you have a happy and healthy and sweet new year. Blessings.